Yo, 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 what's up? What's good? BQ with the Impact Lounge, number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. Welcome back. We're going to talk Impact, do the Impact review for the week. You don't know how, I wouldn't say I'm excited to move. I like living in Illinois, but my move to Vegas coming up. You don't know how I'm excited I am to get in there, get in a new space, a new house, and really like set up these pods the way I want to. I'm not going to bore you with my housing story again. I did once upon a time, and it tires me to tell that story, even think about it, think about um, my whole story, how I got into this house. So I'm um, looking forward to a better office space, more professional setup for you guys, because this is the number one place to be. I can't be having these windows in the background and all this kind of crap, but that's just that's just how it be sometimes. So thanks for swinging by. If it's your first time, consider hitting that subscribe button. Uh, I recently just did an upload on YouTube, and it's also ad-free at patreon.com backslash BQ Speaks. Um, talking about Trinity in Impact and my thoughts. Um, after it was announced that she was the, at least we believe that she had to be the major surprise coming over. So definitely check that out. Also on the Patreon, I just uploaded uh, TNA Rewind. Uh, looking back at a Destination America era that I've never seen before. And it was a, a lockdown episode, so really good episode. Spoiler alert, stuff back then was a lot better than what they're doing today. Um, so we're going to get into this episode. Um, but yeah, Trinity is coming. I'm not going to get you know give too many thoughts here because I already did on the, the previous upload. But to like really kind of summarize what I've got going on, my, on in my brain about it, is that, um, you know, with her arriving, I hope that she has an opportunity to reinvent herself because that's what uh, the Impact fan base, I think, connects to the most. The the Macklins, the EC3s, the, the W Morrisseys. I think that's when we connect. When they come over and they're like, hey, we want you to be your WWE character, Matt Cardona, um, Dango, you know, once upon a time, I know it's a it's a different regime, but Aaron Rex came in, you know, Damian Sandow, whatever, Damian Stevens, Aaron Stevens, I'm sorry. He comes over and at first he's completely rebranded himself. And then within two months, it's go back to what you were doing in WWE. So we're going to see when she comes, you know, comes aboard. Is it going to be aspects of what she did before that works, but updated? Or are they going to be like, hey, just be who you used to be? Because that's where um, I think the fan base doesn't connect. The company seems to want that, but the fan base doesn't. The fan base connects when someone comes and reinvents themselves. I'm not saying a total teardown, but you update uh, what works and find new things that work about you. So let's talk. Let us talk impact. I did not watch BTI this week. Usually when there's someone on there where I'm like, who the fuck is this? I, I just don't watch it. It was uh, Kenny King versus Channing Decker. You may know who that is. You may be like, how the hell do you not know him? I just don't. I don't know. This kicks off with Masha Slamovich. Masha Slamovich and Jordan Grace. Uh, so, real quick. My thoughts on this episode. Uh... There were parts of it I liked, and there were parts I didn't like. I think I would be leaning to more towards I kind of liked the episode, but there were definitely some parts of it that I did not like. Uh, but the things that were good, I thought were good. This did not start off on the right foot for me. Now, the, the theme of this episode was the knockouts. This was a knockouts episode, which is fine. Uh, my concerns with Steve Macklin's title reign is that they're not going to treat him like the main star of the show, main attraction of the show, that he's going to do segments very early in the episodes like Eli Drake used to do. So I have concerns. I don't know which direction they're leaning towards yet because he closed out the episode last week, and here he's like the second or third segment. But being a knockouts heavy show worries me a little bit that they're like, hey, let's – we're in an era where we got to focus on the knockouts instead until Josh comes back. That's what I don't want to see happen, but that's what I'm a little bit worried could be happening. Anyway, we kick off, kick off with Masha versus Jordan Grace. 
I think this was supposed to be the Masha versus Killer Kelly match. I don't I don't know. But we get Masha versus Jordan Grace. Jordan Grace, you always need to win, right? Got to keep Jordan strong, right? I said last week when I episode when I reviewed this episode or reviews reviewed last week's episode that if Masha loses this match, you can stick a fork in her. And when I say stick a fork in her, I mean you can always heat someone up a little bit, but she's on a losing streak. It might not be consecutive matches, but since Bound for Glory, I can only count one match that she's won, which was the four-way at Hard to Kill number one contendership. Someone on Twitter told me, no, she's won three times. I, I don't know versus who. Um, I didn't check. I did ask him who, and I didn't check the response. I, I can't think of you know, a snowplow, a one, two, and a three in the last half year. So you guys can let me know. I'm not saying that that's incorrect. But if she did win matches, it was on, I feel like it had to have been on BTI or something like that because I don't feel like she's done anything since Bound for Glory. She's had multiple title matches, multiple matches with Jordan Grace, cannot beat her. So when I see this on the card, I said, there's no fucking way Masha loses this match. She cannot lose it. Guess the fuck what? Hold on to your dicks. Jordan Grace is the winner. Masha loses. Keep Jordan strong. For what? Um, I mean, I guess we answer that question a little bit later because they're going to have her wrestling Diana Perrazzo again and have her teaming with her. And it seems like the episodes are going to be dominated by her and Diana in the main event in one way, shape, or form. Again, worries me about Steve Macklin as the champion. She could have wrestled anybody. Anybody. Why is Masha losing again? And when you spend the the you know the majority of a year building her squash matches, squash matches, wrestling half the roster and beating them, more than half the roster, sending them the their photos, the Xerox copies of their faces, and putting the X to them or whatever they're doing. You do all that. It's just now she's in that I'm just here for a good match type of role now. I'm, I'm a good hand. Because now she ain't, ain't beating nobody. I mean, didn't she lose to Taylor Wilde at one point? And they were trying to throw you off the scent that she was going to win the, the four-way WWE booking right there. So when I say you stick a fork in her, you cannot heat her up again at this point. I mean, I, I just said a second ago, you, you can always heat people up. You can. But at this point, like, okay, here's a better example. Like, if you needed to heat up Rosemary to challenge her the knockouts title, you could conceivably do that. Because she's not losing every week on TV. She comes in, gets a couple wins. She doesn't really wrestle that often. Number one contender. Boom. Easy. All right. Masha, you spent all that time building her up. She's had multiple shots at the title. Multiple. And lost and has lost them. She's had multiple matches with Jordan Grace, has lost. How do you build her up again to get it to the knockouts title? Because we're gonna get to that point, and it's just like, well, like you can only wrestle for the knockouts title so many times and lose. To lose once and then revisit it a year and a half later, you don't even remember the loss. But we remember the losses. They had to do the lockouts, not the last knockout standing match, unnecessary. Unfucking necessary coming back from Bound for Glory, where they needed to build her up again. And then for whatever reason, put her in that match like the next week, two weeks later, I think, after Bound for Glory. Lose. And then she wins the four-way, which that was the match that she could have lost because she didn't have to be the one pinned. But no, she gets the win to unnecessarily wrestle for the title again a couple months later and lose again. 
So you can you can stick a fucking fork in her, like pair her up with bully or whatever you want to do. But for the rest of this year, you cannot put her in that knockouts title picture. You have to get us to the point that we forgot she lost all these matches. She's gonna have a feud with Killer Kelly. Now, Killer Kelly later in the episode challenges her for, for the next week. I would challenge her too. She's on a freaking losing streak. She doesn't beat anybody. How do you have her lose in the opening match and then Killer Kelly cut a promo later, a little video package saying and basically calling her out? Now, there's people s- speculating that they're actually going to be a team and not actual opponents. And that's where you can save Masha. You team her with Killer Kelly, people will sign up for that. They could conceivably wrestle for the knockouts title, uh, tag team titles, win the titles, and no one would remember that she was losing as a singles competitor. And then you can guide, kind of build her momentum that way. And then when they eventually break off, you can heat her up again as a singles. I think this is one, you know, I use this term loosely, big money match. It's one of the money matches in the knockouts division. Like, people want to see them one-on-one. I've always been, I knew that day was coming, but I've always been concerned about what the storyline was going to be to get them there. And I wish they didn't have the interactions in the hardcore war. This is something that I would like to hear Tom Hannafin with the first time ever matchup. This, this, This would be like a really cool build. Outside of the knockouts title, because usually the build is within the, the titles, right? And then the matches in between are they bump in ch- each other in the hallway and then they wrestle the next week. So I've always been a little concerned about that, but I would prefer that they team up. Now they clearly need tag teams. We Lord knows they do. Um, so we'll see. We'll see if that's what they do. But it makes no sense to just have her lose in the opening match and then get called out later. You know, um, Jordan, we'll talk about the main event later. She didn't need to wrestle on the show to be involved in the main event. That is, uh, WWE does it, AEW does it, where they throw you off, that they're going to show up at the end by throwing them in the middle of the show, and then you think you're not going to see them again. It was unnecessary. The match was unnecessary. It was a good match, but I was very disappointed with the outcome. Let's move on, because that's that was the one that, Picked that off for me in a way that I was like, "Am I gonna like this episode?" But it um there was there were some, you know, redeeming qualities. They were playing a lot of Nick Aldis stuff. So what I had said last week when they did the backstage little interview with Nick Aldis and Jimmy Jacobs randomly shows up and it looks better than anything any interview segment they've done on Impact in years. Visually looks a thousand times better. What I said was, I don't know that this was done on site. I don't know that he's at the tapings. You know, they're playing off, well, champion's prerogative. I'm not going to be there. I don't think he's there. Because what we know with Impact is that they're going to put someone on TV immediately after after they debut after or tease. You know, the fact that he's not on screen tells me he's not there. I could be totally wrong. I don't think he's there. So they're going to do this stuff to keep him you know, keep them relevant with a, within the confines of the show, which is perfectly fine. They, at this point, after this, let us know that Joe Hendry, who was unnecessarily defending his digital media title against Sheldon Jean, is, uh, has, has suffered a broken nose. So maybe they'll strip the title from him and have a digital media tournament. I'm totally kidding. Maybe they'll just make the title go away. That would be... That would be freaking great. Then we get Impact World Champion Steve Macklin in the ring. Talking about that PCO caught him off guard and saying it was a tactical retreat. And I talked about last week as a veteran connecting with veteran wrestlers who don't use their veteran status too much. Like we can recognize... um, the qualities in someone who's a veteran and they don't have to say it because we have this unwritten, I don't know if unwritten rule. You can, you can take this with you in life when you come across veterans, 
the ones who talk the most did the least. All right. The ones who say, I did this and this overseas and blah, blah, blah. They did not. Because the people who really do stuff don't talk about it. Now, that's what works with his character. He doesn't sit there and, you know, make like the military is part of him, but it's not all of him. That's not, he's not Lacey Evans going there and saluting in the ring and being stupid, you know? But I worry when he started going, it was a tactical retreat. I'm a little worried he's, he's bringing too much of that into the character, but you know, small potatoes because I, I, I think he's going to be a great champion. It's just will impact. Let him be the champion he's, he needs to be. But I have concerns with him wrestling, not wrestling, but being featured so early in the show and being involved with Champagne Sierra, excuse me, Champagne Singh and Shira. Last week, I said the security detail would be a great look for him. If he always came down and he had the four guys, the, the security detail, that would be awesome. The, the the players can change. It doesn't have to be the same guys, but bring four indie dudes. And it's a security detail. Like that for me, that's different. That'll work. That is a aspect of uh of military. Like he's like if we've got a you know a commander walking around overseas, or I shouldn't say commander, much higher ranking than that, a general walking around overseas, we're downrange. He's gonna have a security detail walking around with them like more often than not. So I can just be walking around unguarded, you know? And this is like, we're getting champagne sing and sear on the episode next week, I believe. And then they did BTI and they did the, the pre-show. So that we're going to see them more. I don't mind the champagne sing gimmick. I don't, it's, it's a little phony. He does a good job with it. But when the, when Tom Hannafin, like, what would you do if you had money like champagne? Say, Okay, he does not have that money. We know he doesn't. So just don't bring up that nonsense on commentary. But let let him let his gimmick play out in the ring, trying to pay people off and everything. That's that's funny. It's good. I like the name actually a lot. And you guys know I love his theme song. But these are not guys who are associated with winning. And you're associating with your world champion. He does not. They don't fit. Like I hope they're not trying to create a little stable because they do not fit him. If you're going to do something like that, do the freaking security detail. And he can wrestle with them because they're going to be indie wrestlers. So if they're going to have a tag team match, him and two of his goons, you know, it would just be something different. But Macklin's doing his thing, and here comes fucking Santino. And I like Santino, but we are now connecting him, the the comedy character with Steve Macklin. And I don't think that's the right direction you want to go. And then he makes the match though. Um, he calls PCO out. PCO comes out immediately. Just like last week is PCO hanging out in gorilla. We're trying to keep it. Kayfabe. PCO hangs out in the basement with the pink lights. He does not hang out in gorilla waiting for someone to call him out. He comes out immediately. And Santino makes a match, him and Champagne Sting. And that match is going to happen right now. But we're getting uh, we're getting that. And then, you know, uh, Macklin retreats. You know, this match, PCO and uh, Sting, it went longer than I expected it to. I thought uh, PCO was going to squash him, which in a sense he did. It actually gave these guys a little time. And that's how we build up guys like Champagne Singh. We can't be afraid to give him a little bit of time on, on screen. Like if every time he wrestles, he loses in 30 seconds. We're not going to want to see him on TV. And we know it's going to be a joke segment. We know it's going to be a short match. Should give him a little bit of time. Let him, you know, build that character up. And it might be something we want to see. He does the whole like slap schedule thing. And I always thought that was a cool gimmick, but we just don't see that on on TV at all. I'm sure PCO is going to wrestle Shira here pretty soon. But, you know, I actually thought the match was okay. Uh, PCO, you know, did what he did. We're, we're giving PCO a little bit of momentum. Again, I just have some concerns with teaming these guys with Macklin. I think him, him having an unnamed 
security detail who can wrestle if necessarily. I think that works. I think that's what um they should do. That's probably not what they're going to do. And then we get the design backstage, and they are just beside themselves, as if Sammy Callahan just double-crossed them yesterday. They're beside themselves. And this is something that... So we we already know the design is not over with the people. Okay, we know this. Um, Khan is another example of someone just brought in to, hey, be who you were in WWE. You know? Which I, I've said before, I like Khan. I liked the Ascension a lot, even when they sucked. So it's, you know, not a big deal to me. And Alan Angel is one of my favorite wrestlers in the world. Why do I not care about him in Impact? That drives me crazy. But we know the design is not over. Diener here was the best he has ever sounded. Let me make that clear. I'm saying those things about the design. They're not over. But I'm also telling you this promo he cut was the most logical and well-spoken. And it wasn't full of nonsense. Like Eric Young used to get on here and just talk nonsense. This was really, really good. It was lazy because they're just standing in front of the, the TV screens that GM Miller stands for, stands in front of when she's conducting interviews and there's an impact screensaver behind her. They're just standing in that exact area, except they made the TV screens red. Of course they made them red, right? Everyone's red on this show. But that I thought was really lazy. You know, but whatever. I guess I guess maybe I care too much about that kind of stuff. But as far as Diener speaking here, this, we can sink, sink our teeth in this because it's not nonsense. I mentioned Eric Young doing it. Diener does it too. Gets on here and cuts these promos and he's talking about nothing. Jack shit. And this, you can sink your teeth into this. And you can sink your teeth into this feud a little bit more after this. So I have to commend Diener. On this one, um, you know, them walking around, again, acting like Sammy Callahan, uh, you know, fucked them over yesterday was a little dramatic for me. And we get the coven, and they've got candles and a picture of Deanna Perrazzo. And I said last week, I mean, clearly these these segments were recorded one after another. But I said this last week, I liked I liked what they were doing with the coven. Not, I mean, not up to this point. They suck. But... I'm talking about that particular segment was really good. And I felt that they're starting to understand what they want the coven to be. I think the coven is understanding what they need to be. And I felt that as well when Taylor Wilde came out for the main event. And I thought this was good too. So, you know, they're probably transitional champions. But I can dig this. I think her wrestling Gianna, Gianna Peraza was unnecessary. But I think Trinity's first match is against Kylan King. So we have seen Kylan King do nothing but lose. They won the knockouts title. And then they wrestled. She wrestled one-on-one -on -one the week after they won, and she lost again. Taylor Wilde does win. But I, this is unnecessary in my opinion. Do the champion versus champion. You're trying to get the coven, you know, trying to heat them up a little. They're the champions now. Got to build them up. They get, but they're just they're just taking L's. <clears throat> and we have a pretty decent sized knockouts roster, but and they're doing a good job with finding something for all of them to do. But unfortunately, not a lot of them are in a position to take losses. I think that's where we're running into issues. That's where we're running into Masha having to take a take the L, the knockouts champions, uh, excuse me, tag team champions taking L's because who else can do it on the roster? You know, you always got Savannah Evans to lose. Uh, Giselle Shaw loses a lot, so she could have come in and, and lost. I just don't think, I, I think at this point, you have to bring in a couple knockouts for the bottom of the roster. You know, uh, some of the some of the girls they bring in as jobbers, because you can just pay them the the, the uh, per appearance. You know, two hundred bucks. Say, hey, show up at the tapings. Here's four hundred bucks. We 
We just need you to lose a couple of matches. I think they need some people at the bottom. Um, I think we're just to that point now that they, they need that. And Zicky Dice is in the ring, and they have agreed to cover and pay the cost of transportation for Johnny Swinger's opponent, trying to get his jump start to 50 wins. I think 50 wins is a little much. I think if they said 10 wins or 20 wins, we know he's never going to get to 50, but we want to at least believe it's somewhat achievable because if he did say it was just, just say it was 10, and he loses, it loses, loses, but then periodically does win. If he got that 10th win, it would be over with the crowd. And he can get a joke title shot, whatever, but it's something that would have a payoff, you know? So they say it has to be someone from the roster that they were covering the transportation for them. Doesn't the company do that? Doesn't they all the company also pay these guys? Whatever. So a masked luchador comes, El Denerico. <laughs> I didn't realize at first that this was Zicky Dice. I, I I figured it out pretty quickly, but um, this was what it was. You know, it was quick. It was quick and painless, whatever. Then they're immediately backstage, immediately. And Santino walks up immediately, and he sees that it's Zicky Dice, and it doesn't count because it has to be someone on the roster. Zicky Dice is on the roster, but then Zicky Dice says, well, can I get a contract? So what, Zicky Dice is just hanging out backstage? I thought when Santino spoke to him in Spanish that that was fucking funny because then Zicky Dice is like, what? <laughs> That was one of the, the 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 funnier parts of the show by far. And Zicky, I don't find him particularly very funny, but but I thought that was that was pretty good. Speaking of Zicky Dice, so I brought up and Taylor Wilde. I'm talking about all this. If you want 45 minutes of your time wasted each week, listen to Taylor Wilde's podcast. And Zicky Dice was the first one who so I I listen I used to listen to Taylor Wilde's podcast every week and really liked them. And then Zicky Dice was the first one where I was like, "What the fuck did I just listen to?" Ever since her podcast has been part of the Impact YouTube, it has been horrible. Now she prides herself in not asking the the regular questions and the shit nobody cares about. Where did you train? Did you watch wrestling with your grandma? Like, no one cares, okay? So she prides herself in that. But there still has to be a story to who she's interviewing. A wrestling story, because wrestling fans are listening. That is your audience. There still has to be some kind of meat to sink your teeth into as far as the history of these wrestlers. These wrestlers now come on, right? This this. So last week they had a Tennille Dashwood interview. And for whatever reason, I thought it was current. I learned into it. It wasn't, but that was a really good interview. And that's the kind of interview she should do. This week, it's uh, May Valentine from NWA. And his interview was horrible. And they're talking about astrological signs and horoscopes and being spiritual. And it's the whole fucking podcast. So if you want your... 45 minutes wasted check out that podcast if you want to hear her good interviews go to the stuff she did like last year and the year before those those are excellent what she's doing now is not now that that's out of my system Kenny king is backstage talking dude it, it, honestly in bti when they were showing him when i thought he was wrestling java mora i did not know it was this shannon decker guy um, but they had a little run in backstage. Shannon Decker tried to give him some props. Kenny King blew him off. And then he went over to Sheldon Jean and started giving him words of wisdom. And this I would be good with because Sheldon Jean, it's hard to even imagine him doing anything on this roster. Pair him up with Kenny King. You got something. So I think that's where they're going. It kind of reminded me a little bit of Tasha Steele's. Um, no, I think it was Kira Hogan that uh, wanted to take Tasha Steele's into her wing when she first showed up. I got some vibes from that. And it seemed like that's where they were going. And then he made it sound like, well, just do you. And 
I don't know. I, I could I could take it either way that he was just trying to give someone advice and then they're never going to be in contact again or they're going to be a team and that would be beneficial for both parties. I would be I would be down with that. That's what I hope they do. And we get ABC, which I said is a horrible name when you've got a cool name like the Bullet Club. It's like, hey, how can we not any longer take advantage of the Bullet Club branding? Let's call ourselves ABC. And they're wrestling Con and Angels with the design. I feel like sometimes that Penzer listens to my show. Because I'm starting to hear him announce people a little bit differently, or at least try to. And I kind of caught it here. You know what I didn't talk about in the opening match? And I'm sorry to backpedal. I don't have my notes on me because they are in my bedroom and my fiance is asleep. So I have to go off my head a little bit. What the fuck? With the, the juggernaut Jordan Grace? Where the hell did that come from? Now, I'm okay with the name. Don't uh, I'm great with wrestling nicknames. But where the hell did this come from? Did I miss something here? It just really caught me off guard. And Penzer's like, Juggernaut, Jordan Grace. And I'm like, Juggernaut? And he said it so quickly, like he didn't want people to hear him say it. And then throughout the match, or just Juggernaut, they just keep calling her that. I'm like, where the fuck did this come from? Which it's fine, but I mean, words, give us some backstory. Give us something. You can't just take one of your your most uh, noticeable talents, your recognizable one of your stars of the show, and just give her a nickname out of the blue. You can't be like, Dangerous D- Diana Perrazzo out of nowhere. Like, what? So the juggernaut. I don't know what the hell that's all about. Maybe we'll maybe we'll find out. But um, getting back to th- this tag team match, I feel like he is um, trying <laughs> to make to to announce people differently. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you listen. To, you watch WWE, NXT, um, AEW. If you watch Old Impact and it's Jeremy Borash, like they add their own flavor to all the wrestlers. So like Jordan Grace, for instance, they could. She could have come out. They call her the juggernaut. Jordan, you know, you, you just change the delivery up. You change the tone. You change the tempo. You change the pitch of your voice. You do little thing. They call her the juggernaut. Don't whisper, but you feel me on that. You can't just be like, juggernaut, Jordan. So whatever. Um, this match, I'm talking. What I had to say right now is going to be much longer than what I have to say about this match. Because ABC won. I don't care. Did anyone expect Con and Angels to win? At least this was a non-title match because they like to just give be fast and loose with the title matches. Like at least it was a non-title match. I feel like they could probably do more of that. And then we get Dr. Ross backstage with Santino. Someone is taking him out again. Okay, look, my old lady is a, a nurse. She's an she is a home health nurse. She is with her client. 24 7. I don't mean 24 7. She doesn't work 24 day, hours a day, seven days a week. But my point is when she is at work for eight to 10 hours, she is by her side. She is attached at the fucking hip, except when she has to like run to the bathroom real quick. Okay. She does not wear a stethoscope. She has one because she has a medical bag. She does not wear a stethoscope. This is cheesy. Sports medicine doctors do not walk around in fucking lab coats. You think when you're, you know, Jason Tatum goes down for the Boston Celtics and he goes backstage and, and he's getting checked out and the dude is wearing a fucking lab coat? It's so corny. Like, AEW has an actual doctor on screen and he's just in a in a, in a polo. They know they've established he's the doctor and that's all you need. But this wearing the fucking stethoscope and, you know, th- he's not even giving him an examination. He said, you've had multiple head injuries. You need to stay home. Okay, so so has this guy been concussed twice? Is, is that is that he's been concussed and they say, hey, just go home and take a, take a nap. 
So they think he should stay home. Morella has a piece of the hair and Dirty Dingo appoints himself as the new detective of authority, resigns from the assistant or whatever it was. This screams who shot Bravo. And what they were trying to do with that Bravo is when, when they had Bravo, they were trying to spin off Wrestle House. And I liked Wrestle House, but you, it doesn't work within the confines of the show and the wrestling. This screams that. And this was not, the, the Who Shot Bravo was not over with the Impact fans. I think most people liked Wrestle House. Some people hated it, but a lot of people liked it. When they tried to create Wrestle House on the show, it wasn't good. And it hurt Triple XL at the time. And I said it during the podcast, especially with Larry D. How do you save them after this? Everyone at Wrestle House, after they were done with Wrestle House, went back to their lives. But Triple XL, Larry D was this big part of Who Shot Bravo. And they could not rehabilitate them after that. And then they were out of the company. They both asked to leave. So I'm worried about who they're going to bring into this. Because it, it may ruin them like it did with Triple uh, XL. Then we get the Death Dolls backstage. This was not good. Some of you may like this Death Doll stuff, the Undead Realm. Crazy Steve came in, and you know they they did a good job building Decay back up, and Decay is now back to nothing. And they were bringing him into this Undead Realm shit. Watch the impact on pop stuff and watch the presentation of Decay once upon a time. They have fallen so fucking hard. Rosemary has fallen off hard. And I think Rosemary, we always we're gonna like her forever. And that's gonna benefit her. But what they're doing with her on screen does her no favors. And I don't know why they're still so obsessed with trying to find Taya. Turn on the television. She's in another company. Do not play us for fucking idiots. Cody Threat then wrestles against Silesia Sparks. I could watch this Silesia Sparks wrestle all day. <laughs> bring her back, please. I'm begging you. I don't care what the role is. Bring her back. So this uh, this had a little bit of time. It wasn't really a bunch of a squash match. I'm not saying I, I I don't know that I see anything in Jody Threat right now that that says oh we needed to sign her. I'm not seeing it right now. I just see a girl with red hair, which is already nine of them on the roster. Uh, she's wearing my Aunt Wilda's pants or her jeans that she had last week. Um, speaking of my aunt, who the hell did they have narrate that all this segment earlier? I, guess, I think they called my uncle in for that one. That's another sign that he's not there. <laughs> but I'm not seeing anything in Jody, Jody Threat at the moment. But she gets a win. I do like at least that she's got a finisher that's not... It looked like shit last week she did it, but um, it looked better this time. The, the F5, the F416. So at least she's got a kind of a cooler finisher than the majority of the other people on the roster. But after... Her red hair goes off the air, then Killer Kelly and her red hair and her red backstage shit, the same lighting they had for the design. She's saying she found the perfect playmate, someone who's just as sick as twisted as her, Masha. So, you know, is she calling her out or do they want to wrestle together? If they wrestle together, it makes a little more sense why Masha lost. Maybe there's a story there. So we'll see. Gia Miller hosts a new series to take an in-depth look at Frankie Kazarian's impact career. This is not a new series because when they're done looking at Frankie Kazarian's career, we're never going to see this again. They might talk to the Motor City Machine Guns one-on-one, -on -one, and then we're never going to see it again. So uh, just <laughs> I can assure you. But it was really good. It was a way of keeping, um, I, and I'm always asking for stuff like this, you know? It's a way of keeping Frankie Kazarian kind of relevant on screen without him having to wrestle. Keeps him relevant. And, you know, you can play these and eventually build them up to another world title shot just based off these alone. And then he could come in and win one match and he feels strong. So I really like this. I hope that they do more of it. I'm looking forward to it next week. 
and he's been candid about why he left TNA, and I, I think that's good. I think the music in the background is unnecessary. It works if the music fits the fucking mood of what he's saying. You can't just, you know, and then the music has to change. You can't just play one song in the background the other, t- other time, the entire time. Stop with the damn music impact. It's unnecessary. It kills the segments and it takes all the emotion out of it. And then uh, it's We Own the Nighttime. Uh, they play a bunch of the, they play the song forever. Let's, let, let us know that next week Max is going to team up with Singh and Shira against PCO and two partners of his choosing. That'll put butts in seats. Moose and Brian Myers taking a job on Mora and Boopy. Butts in seats. Jody Threat versus Alicia Edwards. Butts in seats. So I, I'm going to say something positive about all that is that when they did the segments on last week's episode, they didn't jump the gun and give us Moose and Myers versus Jabba Moore and Boopy and then Jody Threat and Alicia Edwards the next week. At least they didn't do that. And with this episode, at least they had Jody, Jody Threat get a win. Alicia had a win last week. They should have had Alicia cut a promo this week about Jordan uh, J- uh, Jody Threat, though. Build something up for the next week. But at least they didn't rush the match. Right, or excuse me, Jabba Moore and Boopy, they could have wrestled in a damn tag team match and beat somebody. So at least they didn't jump right into the match with them, but it doesn't benefit them to do the match if they don't get a win at first. At least have them beat somebody and then do the match. And then... Main event, Deanna Perrazzo versus Taylor Wilde. Again, unnecessary title defense. Unnecessary champion versus champion match. But this match was great. Taylor Wilde had that match against Mickey James a couple months ago that I thought was a really huge disappointment. I didn't think it was good. Some people were, oh, the knockouts. No, dude, that match was not good. It was clunky. Taylor can go in the ring. And the gimmick holds her back sometimes. But I thought her entrance and the minimal use of the tarot cards and shit, they used it a little. I thought it worked this time. It wasn't goofy. It's goofy when it's versus the Death Dolls because they're goofy. But against someone like Deanna, who's serious, and Deanna did not allow that gimmick to change the way she wrestled. What I mean by that is like when you had guys like Fala Bond screen, and he was a comedy wrestler. Now his opponent becomes a comedy wrestler all of a sudden. Orange Cassidy, that's a good example. He's a comedy wrestler. wrestler. When he wrestles, his opponent now becomes a comedy wrestler. With this, when they're doing the goofiness and the spookiness, Deanna did not change who she was. She didn't, oh, why did you bring the kid? What did the tarot card say? She she didn't play into that. She was just the virtuosa, the virtue fucking osa. So this was a really good match. And obviously we know Deanna's gonna win. But this was this was one of their better knockouts matches in a while. They have three knockouts matches on the show. I don't think Taylor Wilde is weak by losing this, but I wouldn't keep beating the coven nonstop. I don't really understand the point of that. Other than they're just going to be transitional champions. For because after this, they're attacking her, and here comes Jordan Grace. And they've already pre-announced that they're going to wrestle for the Knockouts Tag Team titles. Now, Jordan Grace is getting a last chance match, so we're going to see them wrestle again. I mean, Jordan can't beat Deanna, so I mean, are they either... I, I don't know what the outcome of that is going to be, other than the Coven ruining the match. That's all I can think of. Now, if Grace, I don't I even want to speculate what the hell they're doing here. I don't know why she would have that last chance match because anyway, let me not rack my brain over that. But I think they're going to be transitional champions and I think they're going to drop the fucking titles because they're trying to get Mercedes Monet to team up, team up with Trinity. They're probably going to run through Masha and Killer Kelly and, and kill that momentum. And then, you know, the knockouts tag team titles are a nightmare. But I'm going to give uh, a lot of props for this main event. And, you know, Deanna Perrazzo just continues to be a star. And then they do the the kayfabe breakdown after. I don't I don't care about that. You guys can let me know if you think it's any good or not. I don't plan on checking it out anytime soon. 
So that is it for me. I always hit that 45 minute mark. Doesn't fail. I'm your boy BQ. Thanks for checking out the impact review here at the lounge. I'm out. Peace.